Uh, there's nobody here yet. I'm going to play some tunes and see if anybody is available and shows up. I think I'll be able to see you uh, because I've got something that shows me how many people are watching, which so far says one for me. Um, I'll also put here in the chat bar that you can type questions there. And you should be able to see that uh, when you log on, I guess. We'll see. I've never done this before, so this is going to be uh, fun to figure it out. <laughs> I don't think I can talk to you, but you or I don't think I can hear you. Hey, look, there you said hello, and more than that, you're embarrassing me. <laughs> uh, well, I don't really know uh, how to do this, um, and it could be that there's a way that you can actually ask me questions live and we can talk to each other, um, but if you have questions, or things about your playing, or just want to hear some tunes, we can do any of those things. I, um, this is for whatever you and anybody else who might log on wants it to be. Any thoughts? <laughs> Oh, there's something here that says invite to broadcast. Maybe that means you can also talk and that might be nice, but maybe you don't want to do that, but then you could say, no, I don't want to, presumably to an invitation. Let's see what happens. Okay, that I can only do that if I upgrade my plan. Well, it was nice to think about talking to you anyway. <laughs> um, I'll play some more tunes unless you type me some questions or things that you ought to talk about. Maybe with only one person, this would make more sense in Skype, but <laughs> here we are. Uh, so this is an awesome um, Down East tune that I've been really excited about recently. It's called Don Messer's Breakdown, and it's a tune that he played a lot um, back in his radio and TV days. <laughs> ah, I see what you're saying. I think you can only type questions. I think you're right. Can you talk about tone and embellishments? I would love to. Um, so, one of, most of the things um, to do with tone are gonna come from the bow hand. Bow hand, boy, it's also hard to judge where it is in front of the camera. Um, a lot of it is about the bow and how it interacts with the string. Um, and let's see if I can get this in good light. Um, you know, if you're nice and parallel to the bridge, that's going to give you a clearer tone than if you're bowing sort of crooked. Then you tend to be sliding somewhat along the string, and that gives you um, a fuzzier kind of tone. Um, which is why people say keep your bow parallel to the bridge or stay in the tone zone. Uh, sometimes people call it. It also has to do with how you move your right arm. So it's why you don't want to move from the shoulder, because if you move from the shoulder, you tend to be moving a bow crosswise like this. Whereas if you move from the elbow um, and use your wrist, it's easier to get a nice uh, straight bow and a nice sounding tone. Um, another big thing that affects your tone is um, how your bow and the string are interacting in terms of how fast your bow's going, how um, hard you're pressing, and what um, string you're on. 
And uh, those factors, you just need to play around until you figure out um, what the sweet spot is for each string. Um, I like to kind of press a little bit. Um, and actually, if you look, let's see. Um, I actually press with my pointer finger almost so the, so the bow stick is touching the hair, not usually quite that much. And then as soon as I move the bow, I release. And that gives that little crunch that's very characteristic to fiddle playing at the beginning of the bow stroke. And I don't do it for every stroke, but um, for a lot of a lot of bow strokes. Um, and so it's releasing that pressure as soon as you move the bow, because if you don't, you get this, which is the sound um, of too much pressure for how fast you're moving the bow. So it's a press and a release as soon as you start moving. And then sometimes as you get towards the tip of the bow, and that's the other factor, I guess, is where you are on the bow. As you get towards the tip, you often need to press a little bit harder out there because um, more natural weight all in here with the frog and your hand. So you can be very light. Uh, if you're not trying to get that crunch, you in fact need to almost be holding the bow up in the air with your hand and just barely letting it touch the string, uh, especially if you're moving your bow very slowly. Um, for a slow bow, you need a very light touch. Hmm, I need rosin. Um, whereas if you're moving more quickly, you can press more strongly without getting a bad sound. Um, but in general, you know, if you are getting that kind of sound, um, you are pressing too hard, or more commonly, you're moving the bow too slowly that you're thinking about what you're doing, um, maybe with your fingers or with the bowing, and um, you are um, slowing your bow down as you think, which is very, very, very common. Um, you know, if I'm thinking, okay, third finger, second finger, um, then I tend to get that crunching noise. On the other end of the spectrum is, kind of harmonic -y sound of too light. Um, and I find that this is actually more common with my adult students, that you tend to want to be quiet and you feel like the violin is very, very loud, and in fact it's often not very loud um, to other people around you, or not as loud as it is to you. Uh, and so people do two things. They'll play down here over the fingerboard, which is a very quiet spot, and also has this weird warble zone right about the, at the end of the fingerboard. I'm not hitting it. There it is. And that's just something about that spot. There's like a harmonic there that interferes. So if you move the bow out of that spot, um, you'll get a clear tone, um, but people tend to be, be very light with the bow, too light, and um, in my opinion, and over the end of the fingerboard there where it's quiet. Um, so you also have a louder sound and need to press a little harder when you're closer to the bridge. So there's like, <laughs> I don't know, five or six different factors on how the bow and the strings are interacting, how close you are to the bridge, uh, how hard you're pressing, how fast your bow is moving, what string you're on, whether you're near the tip or near the frog, and there's probably something else that I haven't thought about um, or have forgotten that I already said. Um, so there's just a, so many factors that that's what makes tone really challenging. Um, but what you can do is you can try to do some of these things wrong so you can really hear what those sounds are like. So purposefully, you know, try out the sound way down here. Try out the sound near the bridge, pressing really light, and then pressing harder. Uh, my favorite spot to play is usually right about here. Uh, it's a nice, clear sound. Um, I also tend to like to play on the lower section of the bow here, rather than some play, people play mostly at the tip. Um, and that's also kind of a lighter sound. And I like the more percussion, percussive sound that you get from being near the frog. Um, so you can just, you know, play around with finding that little bit of bite with your pointer finger pressing, pressing the bow and releasing, and it's a little harder on the up bow. So again, kind of pressing and releasing as you go and listening for that at the beginning of the sound. Uh, 
The other thing you can experiment with is what happens at the end of your bow stroke. So there's the percussion at the beginning, or you can try it without, just a smooth start. But then what happens at the end? Do you just stop? Because that tends to be a not very inspiring sound. And mostly what um, we tend to not really like the sound of, even if we can't necessarily artic articulate it, um, is something that stays the same. We really like change um, in sound. So the press at the beginning, with or without the crunch, and letting the letting the string breathe at the end of the stroke. articulations is having your bow hand relaxed enough so that you can um, make a smooth transition between strokes rather than an abrupt kind of stopping motion. Um, let's see, other things about tone. Oh, of course, this is all a lot harder when we stop just playing an open string and start playing a tune. Um, so I've been working actually, I've been working on this with a bunch of my students recently and um, what they, um, what we've been doing is taking some tune that they know really well um, or sometimes a new tune. For some people that's proving to be easier to not have something that you've already played and have kind of habits around how you play. Uh, but taking a tune and going just a few notes at a time. So. Um, uh, let's say Road to Boston, because I know that's a tune that you um, have interacted with, for sure. Um, and just thinking for one thing about, like, what kind of tone do we want here? Um, you know, it's a pretty bold tune. It um, You really want that kind of polka dance beat to come across. It's not like a beautiful jig or waltz that you want really smooth. You want some bow articulation. Um, nice bold strokes and even starting with just the first two notes and trying to get them to sound really the way that you want them to sound. And then when you can do those first two, try the next couple. It's almost like you're figuring out the tune all over again, but now you're figuring it out and paying attention to, am I getting a good sound rather than just, am I hitting the notes and am I hitting them in the rhythm? And then you might go to the next section. And string changes tend to be a place that are problematic for a lot of people. Um, that you might get a little delay. You know, and you maybe haven't put your finger down all the way, which is what happened, um, what I demonstrated that time. Or you get a blip because you haven't put your finger down at all which can also actually be an embellishment if you're doing it on purpose, um, a grace note kind of thing. Um, you can hit the string you're coming from, the E string, with your finger as it's going down and you haven't moved your bow. So there are all kinds of things that can happen around string changes that um, often warrants extra practice. And I would go back. And see if I can get it clearly in that um, in that whole string of notes, and then maybe I would go to the beginning, or maybe I'd do the next section. And I might practice that a couple of times. Maybe I'd try it with some slurs. Um, if I felt like it, and just always be trying to listen for the tone and treat it like a mistake when it's not what you want it to be. Um, and that can, that what you want it to be can vary from person to person and style to style. Um, certainly there's, um, there are some wonderful fiddle players um, who don't play with a tone that I personally like best, but it's not a 
bad thing. It's just not my thing. And I'm sure my playing is not what some people um, want in terms of tone either. Um, so for me, I like a kind of blend of percussion and um, and clarity. <laughs> and sometimes I do play with some of those sounds that you mostly avoid, like the, the kind of airy sound with the, lots of harmonics in it. Um, can be sort of a special effect sound. Um, let's see, any other t big tone things that come to mind? I mean, I guess the other big thing that um, you can use to color the tone of a note would be vibrato, which is sort of a topic, a bigger topic. Um, and I don't use a lot of vibrato, um, sometimes in slow tunes, occasionally in um, in other tunes. Let me think. Um, so like right there at the end of that jig, there's a long note. I'm putting a tiny amount of vibrato on the final note. And in those long jig notes, I more often slide to provide some color, but I am putting also just the hair of vibrato on here, and um, I'm doing that just by by planting my finger and having my hand be really relaxed so that I'm moving my hand a little bit, which just gently um, causes my finger to rotate on the string a little bit and that changes the pitch just in, you know, incrementally. Um, that's another fun tune I've been excited about recently another one from the repertoire of Don Messer. Um, it's called Buckwheat Batter. Um, yeah, I should do a lesson for that one. It's a really fun, cool New england -y jig. Um, but to get to your other question um, about embellishments, there's lots and lots and lots of things. Um, maybe looking at the Road to Boston again, um, since that's a fairly familiar tune for a bunch of people and other people can um, watch this afterwards, I think. Um, and maybe I'll just go through, maybe I'll play the tune um, a couple of times to just explore some things myself here. And then I'll go back through and go through some of the options that you have. I've got lots of ideas now. Um, one of the big things, obviously, that I was doing in the tune are double stops. Um, we're in the key of D, so I end up using A and D a lot as drone notes. Um, you can do that right off the bat. 
with the F sharp playing an open A. And you could in fact play open A all, with all those E string notes and then open D with the A string note, but that I find a little bit maybe overbearing. It's like a little too much. So um, I like it right at the beginning. And then leaving it off on the G, which the A and the G don't um, go very well together, though occasionally I really like those notes together. Um, <laughs> more on that another time. I'm going to play all those notes single. Of course, that time I played the A with the G. And then uh, came off the double stop. So um, a lot of it is personal taste at the moment. This is another thing I really do a lot um, in D and G. Um, we have this little run. And anytime you have a scale kind of run where you hit the third finger, you can keep that third finger down and play it along with the next two notes. So in this case, the phrase starts on the C sharp. And so holding the D, playing the D against the E, which is the next note, and then the D against the F sharp, which is the note following that. So let's see, so far we can put the double stops. And I could play all those notes on the D and the A string. The trick is to keep um, your bow on those two strings while your fingers move from one to the other. So I'm playing D and D, open D and A, F sharp and A, and back to the D and A. And I might not play... Like, I feel like I would commonly do that. Double stop, double stop, single note, and double stop. And that gives that melody a little bit more clearly. Uh, so let's see, what have we got so far? Of course, there I did it opposite. I played oh, nothing, nothing, double stop, and nothing. So <laughs> it's a matter of choice at the moment. Did I say that already? I think I did. Second half. Same opportunity there. Um, and you can bring that D string in for the ending. Um, you can bring it in for only one note. It'd probably be weird to do the other one. Uh, not too weird. Um, a few um, double stops in the B part as well. And then we'll talk about the other kinds of um, embellishments. So some places I like the A. Sometimes I bet I keep it going all the way through. Yeah, I'm sure I do that a lot. <laughs> uh, the next note is a G. Doesn't sound so good with the A. We did it before, but we're not going to do it this time. Um, I would play a G chord on um, that G with the melody note and B on the A string. You can also make a G chord using the D on the A string, the third finger. Um, but I don't like the sound of that as well here. And then I'm bringing the A string back in there. And then a D chord, which I either play F sharp and open A, or I would use F sharp and D. So for that third kind of walking down, 
Um, there are three different things that I do. One is the open A string. One is using the D on the A string and then going to the open A. And the third is using the D string on the A, uh, the D on the A and keeping it there. Um, so I do all of those from time to time. That's that same line from the A part. Bring the A string back in there. So. played the tune once I have that D down on the A string and I might start right out with that as my double stop instead of open A which we did since I've just already played the D I might leave it down all through that section and use that as the drum um other things that aren't drones, because there are lots of them, and drones can sometimes be really frustrating, drones and double stops. Um, it can be hard to get the two strings, you really have to keep your bow moving, and you tend to be thinking like, okay, what's happening? Am I on both strings? And which fingers am I supposed to use? And are my fingers bumping the strings? <laughs> and it, so um, sometimes it can be a funny embellishment to start with, but sometimes it can also just get frustrating. So it's nice to have some other things. Um, the easiest and most satisfying ornament that I use all the time is just grace um, grace notes. And one I sort of re I refer to as a hammer on, which is a term borrowed from fretted instruments. Um, I'm dropping my finger down onto the string and I'm doing it just a moment too late. Uh, so instead of playing, I'm gonna drop it down. There's a little moment of open E. And I actually did two in there. I did one here and here. So here I have the F sharp down and I'm hammering on the G. So I did one more. Um, and I did it, um, I actually used a special finger instead of going from A to D. I like the sound better of the C sharp. So I'm adding an extra note really, an extra C sharp. So let's go slowly through that first half of the A part um, using E before that first F sharp. Same thing for the ending often. So those are three of the um, three of the four types of grace notes I use. I'm pretty sure. Um, so one is going from open string to a note, um, which is also usually the note below um, the target note. The other is um, the note that I just played, which is often also the note below. That's this. So I'm repeating the F sharp briefly uh, that I just played. And the third one we looked at is do adding a special note that's also the note below the target note. The fourth 
thing that I use, and I think that's all of them, um, is using an open string that's not the string I'm hitting. Um, so you could actually do that in this tune. You could even, well, we won't go there. You could do it in, in uh, conjunction with the first thing. But um, instead of the first thing, you could hit a little open A and then quickly rock your bow to the E string to that F sharp. Um, so then you could put those two things together and play the A, rock to E, and quickly add the F sharp. Or you could do them both at the same time, the double stop. Um, lots of details in there. Um, so um, that I love to use. Let's look at where I use it in the B part just for a second. Um, I actually use a variation of this idea um, right at the beginning of the B part often. I like to run all my fingers up the scale um, on the string. Sometimes I'll do just a G sharp to A, which is that note below idea. I use G sharp even though it's not in the key of D. Um, but I like it better. The G doesn't sound sound right to me. I think fiddle players tend to use this half step um, even if it's not in the key. So I use two um, of those hammers on hammer ons here, there, and here. Do that again. And those are both notes on the beat, and that's the place where I'm most commonly going to use this um, in embellishment. Here again, and here again on the beat. something else that I'll talk about in a second. That's kind of the same idea, but not quite. Um, but what I first was talking about and then got sidetracked is that running all the way up the strings. And again, I think I'm using G sharp. Yeah, I think I'm using G sharp there, even though it's not in the key. I don't notice a huge difference there between the G sharp and the G natural. And that's really kind of fun against a, a drone as well. So it's just like letting your fingers run uh, and keeping them super relaxed and just moving them and seeing how it sounds. Um, the other super easy to start putting in um, early on embellishment is a slide. Um, which I do a lot in a lot of different kinds of music, um, probably more than the native players of that music might use. Um, so that's something I might choose to do on that first note of the tune instead of a, um, the hammer on, but possibly also in conjunction with the, with the drone. So actually starting with my finger on F natural and sliding it to F sharp. Uh, and I actually particularly like the sound of it against a drone. So there I just use a combination. I use the slide with drone. And here's a hammer on. And I could slide there. Um, I could slide without the drone. I could do the hammer on. That sounds weird. 
Oh, there's another place to slide. So there I'm sliding from C sharp. Let's see. Yeah, so that, that ending again. Um, most of the places that I put embellishment are notes that are important. Um, often it's notes that are on the beat. Um, yeah, on the downbeat. Occasionally I will embellish other notes, but almost always they turn out to be on the beat. And um, that I think you just pick up from a lot of listening to fiddle music and you'll start to hear that um, that's what almost everybody does. I would say that's a little less true maybe in Irish music, but there tends to be more embellishment um, on other notes for a variety of reasons. I think partly uh, this is totally my own theories, no uh, hard facts here and no, not a whole lot of research besides my own personal uh, exposure. Um, but I suspect that that's partly to do with, um, certainly I think there's a, a correlation to instruments like the Ellen pipes, um, where there's a steady stream of air and um, in order to separate two notes that are the same, you have to um, play some other note in between them or it just sounds like one long G or whatever the note is. Um, and so that leads definitely to embellishment or um, ornamentation in between notes that might not be on the beat. Um, the other big thing I think is that the Irish tradition has become a little bit more for listening. Um, and I suspect that in all the traditions um, where, the, um, where the emphasis is on listening rather than on music for dancing, that um, that they'll tend to maybe put some more embellishment in on not necessarily beat notes. But for dancing, certainly the primary job of the fiddle player uh, is here's the beat, here's the beat, here's the beat, here's the beat. Um, so we tend to do a lot right on the beat notes. Um, uh, in the beat part, uh, back to the sliding idea, I might slide right there. G sharp to A. I don't, I don't think I would really slide there. Here though. Um, so it, for me, most of my sliding tends to happen on also notes that are part of the main chord that goes with the key of the piece. So we're in the key of D, the notes of a D chord are D, F sharp, and A, and those are the ones that I tend to slide. I'm not saying that I won't do something else because I'm sure I definitely do, um, but those are the ones that tend to, I think that it's partly because they tend to fall on the beat, um, and they certainly tend to um, call out to my ear and say, slide me. <laughs> so just like try some, you know, sliding your fingers around, it, it'll sound bad if you are not in the place that sounds good. And you'll know, and then you won't do it. Or you will. <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> and if you do something like that, people will think you're crazy. Um, um, there was one more thing. Oh, yeah, one more super easy thing, embellishment-wise, before we get into a couple of the... I guess there's only two tricky things that I'll do in this tune, um, or that are a little a little harder. Um, but another great way to embellish is just to change rhythms and maybe add other notes. Um, but often all I'm doing is changing a rhythm. So I was doing some of that, which made me think I should talk, mention that I'm doing it. So I can play it that way, or I can play change that first rhythm. Um, I do that a lot. There I added a couple more notes. So instead of just... Or 
you could just add the E. That's nice too. Yeah, see, I think that's the same thing in the B part with this particular tune. That I would tend to play either the long bows. Or that um, three note rhythm. I might mix them up. tend to do that um those kind of extra pickup notes going into the a part a bunch too so sort of anywhere i go into the a part whether it's from the b part or repeating the a um i like those extra notes um there aren't too many extra notes i would add into this tune but in some tunes like especially um an old time tune like uh what's a nice common one um uh, like Sandy Boys. Um, play with those long bows. I could play it with um, some other rhythms. Um, I could play it with other notes. Um, so in other tunes, I might use more other notes and more different rhythms, um, especially in old time, though there is, um, we would call that like melodic variation or melodic embellishment, um, because you're changing the melody a little bit, um, definitely does happen in, um, like Irish traditions and Scottish traditions. Sometimes there are established variations that people will play. That's especially true in like Scottish and Cape Breton music. Um, there are other things, maybe in Irish music, that somebody has done, and so somebody else will hear it, and then they'll do it too. Uh, I have that with a tune that I learned from Alden Robinson, and I always think of him when I play this one little like high introduction to the B part, which isn't what I would normally play, but he plays it that way, and it's really nice, and I stole it. <laughs> um, um, okay, into the hard things. I've been avoiding them, but here they come. Um, so two harder things to do. One I call the flick. Um, and I know there's another name for it, and I always forget what it is. It's not a crayon, that's something else. Flick. Um, ah, uh, shoot. There is a video that I've made that's on the website um, that is called Flick Cuts. That's the other name, um, I think. And somewhere in the, I think I put it even in a new title uh, or somewhere in the discussion of that video, there certainly are other people chiming in on what uh, they call it in their region. I just call it Flick because it's kind of what your finger does and I didn't have a better name for it at the time. Um, so what you're doing is just lightly tapping the string um, just to the point where you would stop the note from sounding. Um, and that can separate notes like we were talking about, I was talking about in the Irish kind of piping tradition, it, imitating that we can um, actually for this, for those first two F sharps, if you were a piper, you'd have to separate them. You don't have a bow that goes back and forth. You have to separate them somehow so you could play a note. Um, or if we are imitating that on the fiddle, we might just tap the finger. And we could do it in a single bow then. And that's a really great place to first start doing flicks is in the middle of a bow stroke like that. Because uh, you don't have to be quite as precise as you do for what I'll show you in a second. So what I tend to do actually is put 
a lot of flicks right at the beginning of a note to say, hey, here's the beat again. So, um, and actually I would often put one in that, I guess that um, that is also a beat, that second F sharp. Um, and I would tend to usually play it with a, second, a separate bow. Um, and just, it's that quick, like, lift off sound with maybe a hint of F sharp before it. So it should sound like an interrupted F sharp as opposed to this is what people want to do. They want to press down the A and actually play the note. That's a grace note. That's not, um, that's not the cut. It's just a super light tap. And sometimes people use other fingers. Um, if I'm playing a third finger note, I'll use the pinky to tap. Sometimes I'll use my second finger, but more often I'll use the third. You can also do it on an open string. So you can uh, practice them like that in the scale. I just saw something lit up in q and A. I'm just going to check out what that is. That's probably you a while ago. Oh, look, a cut note. Yes. Oh, very good. <laughs> that's what it is. I don't know if you just put there, but um, that's good. I'm going to show the question to the audience, which is nobody. But uh, there we go. Oh, interesting. Now it's big. Okay, I'm going to take it away again. This is great. I'm learning all kinds of things. Uh, back over to chat. Here we go. Okay, so now I can just see if you ask more questions. Cool. Um, cut, indeed. Um, it's good to know you're still there. <laughs> I haven't fallen asleep. <laughs> As I blather on, I feel like I'm just talking a blue streak. But I'm hoping that you're finding it helpful and illuminating. And by all means, redirect me if it's not. Um, so in this tune, um, I could do one right off the bat, but I'm more likely to use the hammer on and do the flick afterwards or the cut. So I just put in another one there. That's the, like a pretty tricky place to put it because you've just played the second finger. You're putting down the first and flicking with the third. That would be sort of advanced cutting. And I might just as likely not do it there. Except, oh, I might do it with the second finger. That makes it a little easier. <laughs> I just saw your note. <laughs> okay. So let's see where else in the A part. I wouldn't do it if I was doing the double stop that we talked about. Because then my third finger is busy. So all of these are options that you can pull out at any time. Um, and I think listening, again, is like the big way. Just listening to a lot of people's playing and um, subconsciously sort of picking up what those things are. And also then trying, you know, taking this tune or another tune and saying, okay, I'm going to try putting something in here. What might work? And try to do that a few times and then think, okay, what else could work in this spot? I want something more here. Um, and then you sort of get those um, options in your fingers and in your ear a little bit. So um, I'm going to go from the top of the A again because I forgot where I was. There's one. I can do one there. So that's almost, I'm not really playing the G, but it's almost a little bit more like a rolling off the note. So there's a bunch of flick opportunities um, in the B part. Did I do something there? I might have. Nope. Ah, uh, there's one. 
um, on the G as the target note. So it is like a moment of the G before the flick. Again, a flick there. This is the same place that I would be putting the um, the hammer on. Or is it? It's not the same place. So I might do, in fact, both. I might do slide. <laughs> hammer on. I missed it. Like maybe there too. <laughs> There's so many options. Hammer on. Click. As the double stops to round off. <laughs> okay. Whew, that was exhausting. Um, so there's lots of good options. Um, the only other ornament that I think I don't think I would use a roll in this piece. Uh, I have a video about rolls. It's, I'll just mention it because it's a flick plus a lift. But there's not really, uh, you could maybe, I don't know. You could theoretically put a roll there, but it doesn't really sound very right to me i don't really like it there um use them more in jigs and reels than in polkas and mostly in irish tunes though occasionally i'll throw them in another style of tune as well um but the one other thing that i use in here is this fun little ornament it's not too hard to do um though it's a little harder than like the slides uh and the hammer on but um I call it a wiggle because that's what Lisa Schneckenberger calls it. And she's the first person who I just really noticed doing it. And for years it was like, what is she doing? How is she getting that sound? Um, and then I had a, this great moment. Um, it was like the last lesson before the summer, not last year, but the year before, um, with one of my young students. And she did it by accident. And I was like, wait, stop everything. What did you just do? How did you make that sound? I've been wanting to know how to do that for years. Of course, I never just asked Lissa, but I could have done it at any point. Um, but then I later confirmed that summer with Lissa at camp um, that this is, in fact, what, what she does and that she calls it a wiggle. Um, I hear it a fair amount in Irish music, though um, maybe more kind of coming out of the Boston area. Um, I don't know if it's Berkeley School of Music people or where it's coming from, but it's around. Um, and it's kind of cool sounding. And what it is, um, it's great for the end of this tune. And it's like you're playing a note and then you're thinking, wait, no, was it supposed to be a C sharp? No, it was supposed to be a D. <laughs> um, so it's a, you're playing the D, but you're immediately then playing a C sharp and back to the D. All in one bow. Or if you're using that walking up to the B part, you can still do it. In fact, you could maybe even do other. I've I've only really done them with the third finger, but there's no reason that you couldn't do them other places. Uh, hmm, that's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, this is, in fact, you know, it's really an ornament that I'm still, um, that's fairly new to my repertoire. Like I said, I only figured out how it worked, um, you know, a little, maybe a year and a half ago. So I'm really... Like, it hadn't really ever occurred to me to try it with the first finger before. Um, it works really nicely with the third finger and second finger. 
but you could. Do it with any uh, finger combination, though doing it with like on an open string wouldn't really work. Um, and so when I'm trying to do any of these new, a new ornament for me, um, like this wiggle, what I do is I like try to put it everywhere and I put it more places and more times than I would ever think was appropriate once I learned it. Um, and that's just a way of practicing it and getting it in there. Um, and so, you know, you could try going through a tune and, you know, just, you know, flick on a whole bunch of the notes or find, you know, every opportunity where it might sound good to flick in this tune and try it. Um, do the same with a wiggle, you know, go all the way through and play double stops through the entire tune. Um, a great one to try with that is, um, uh, Angela and Baker, pretty simple for the left hand and um, it doesn't sound too terrible anywhere to play the double stop so you can just kind of go all the way through playing um, usually on the string below. Um, you know, take that same tune and um, flick. Why not? Oh, of course, that's a hammer on. We'll do hammer ons. <laughs> you know, it would sound like too much to do that all the time. So it's a great way of practicing them and then you can sort of figure out which ones you like and which ones you don't and then use those some of the time. So I like both of those. I wouldn't do them. That would be sort of overwhelming, but I would do either one. Whoops. <laughs> I did both by accident. Um, and take that same tune and flick. Uh. <laughs> this is horrible. And what you might find is what I'm finding right now that I don't really like the flicks in the, in Angela and the Baker. And it's not uh, something that's used a lot in that style of playing in the kind of old time style. That's not really common ornamentation. Um, whereas slides, or double stops are much more common in that old time style. So you can try the sliding. Oh, that's kind of an interesting one. I don't think I've tried that before. And what you'll find is that a lot of this stuff works in a lot of different places you don't want to put it in all of them in a certain time through the tune, but there's nothing that says you can't use it in all of those places on different times through the tune. Um, let's see, any parting shots? I see we're at 7.59 all of a sudden. Um, so let me think. Any last minute questions from you or something that you'd like me to clarify? Okay. <laughs> See, none. Um, you know, I think just sticking, sticking with those embellishments and listening and, you know, listening to other fiddle players and noticing for, you know, when you hear something that says, wait, I want to be able to do that. Figure out, you know, is it a flick? Is it a um, roll? Is it a um, double stop? And, you know, figure out how to make it and practice it in that place a whole bunch of times and have that in your repertoire for um, how you approach that tune. Um, so uh -huh. that and don't beat yourself up if it's not all happening at once. If you can't make the beautiful sound with the ornamentation and add variations and um, have all those things happen at once, they usually don't. 
that you usually have to kind of pick what you're working on. You know, am I going to get all the notes this tune or am I going to try putting some of the other things in? Um, sometimes you have to let go of some of the things that you, um, um, that you know how to do in order to learn how to do some new things. So um, this has been fun. I'm glad you came because otherwise I would have been just here talking to myself for an hour uh, or I don't know, maybe I would have given up. Um, but um, we'll do another one of these next month. So save up your questions. And um, I suppose also if you think of anything in, in advance, you could email me or send me a message through Patreon. Um, and I could think more about how I might address that. But I'm also happy to just take questions off the cuff um, and do my best. <laughs> Um, but we'll do another one next month. I'll send out the date um, as it, and maybe I'll figure it out even what it would be right now um, and try to send that out because November is a pretty busy month. I should probably figure it out right now and get it in my calendar. Um, probably another weeknight like this. So um, this has been super fun. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> I wish I could see you and say hi, but <laughs> you have to know that I'm imagining you and saying hello. <laughs> and I will... Um, talk to you again next month. You kept erasing your questions. Oh no. Okay. Well, I'm glad I, I hope that means that I got and got to them and answered them and, um, I'll see you next time. Thanks for being awesome. <laughs> All right. Good night.